Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Mike. I work at the Yonkers Public Library. Tonight, we're lucky to have Dennis Richman with us. And he is going to be talking about his family genealogy. Dennis is the founder of the Dennis E. Richman Junior Scholarship for Black Excellence. And he's also the founder of the New York, the New York, New Jersey HBCU Initiative. And on top of that, he's also the author of He Spoke at My School, an Educational Journey. He works at the LOF, which is the LGBT Community Service Center, and he's a journalist and historian. So thank you so much for being here, Dennis. And I'm so excited to what to view your presentation. You know, it's going to be really interesting. Mike, thank you so much for having me. And to all of the folks here on this call, here on the Zoom, here with us this evening, thank you. You could have been anywhere else and you're here. So thank you so much. I'm excited. I'm glad and I'm really happy. <laughs> so with that being said, Mike, can you see what I'm sharing right now? Yes. Awesome. This is my presentation. So without further ado, let me hop right in. My name is Dennis Richman Jr. And this is the presentation that I have for you all today on my family. And I have it up until 2021 because I have not done any research yet this year. So I'm yet to do any research for 2022. This picture starting off is of my father. My name is Dennis Richmond Jr. And my dad's name is Dennis Richmond Sr. My dad was born in 1955 in New Rochelle, New York. This picture was taken in New Rochelle in the 1950s. I like this picture because I see my dad in a hoodie. And when I think of the 1950s, I don't think of hoodies. So to see him in a hoodie is kind of cool to me. This is a picture of my grandmother around the same time that the other photograph was taken. My grandmother's name was Joyce Marie Watkins. Her name was Joyce Marie Watkins, and she was born in Greenwich, Connecticut in 1937. Here's a picture from August 1961 at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York on Fifth Avenue. If you look, there are two boys in the front. To the left is my dad and to the right is my uncle Michael. In the back is my great grandmother Adele and my great grandfather Adrian. And to the right is my grandmother Joyce and my uncle Larry. The 1960s fashion is just beautiful. I mean, those coats, my goodness, 1960s. More pictures of dad when he was young. And I'm sharing these photographs with you all to give you an idea as to who my family is as we dive in. One thing about my family is that they always took pictures, always. Now, how far back that goes, we'll find out. But my family always took pictures. These are pictures of my dad and his uncle, excuse me, my dad and my uncle Michael. Here's another picture of my dad, except this time he's with his grandmother, Adele Matilda Merritt. That's my great grandmother, Adele, Adele Matilda Merritt. That picture was taken on North Avenue in New Rochelle, New York. This has to be one of my most prized family photographs of all. This is a picture from 1940 in New Rochelle. And in it, in the middle is my grandmother, Joyce Marie Watkins. To the left is her brother, Thomas Sinclair Watkins Jr. And to the right is her sister, Lilia Mary Watkins. And they're eating graham crackers. I love it because I love to eat. So it's good to know that eating actually runs in my family, even as far back as the 40s and taking pictures while eating, which is like unheard of in the 40s. So my family is kind of like breaking down barriers. So yeah, go graham crackers. Adele Matilda Mary, my great grandmother. What do I know about her? Because before you dive into research, you have to know what's what. I know that Adele had four children, Thomas, Lilia, Joyce, and John. 
I know that she worked as a nurse and I know that she was born to Greenwich and her family relocated to New York sometime around 1929 in the Roaring Twenties. These are some of the photographs that I have of my great grandmother. The photographs at the bottom left and bottom right are from the 1970s. The photograph at the top left is from the 1950s. The photograph at the top right is close to 1980. And the beautiful picture in the middle is her school photo in Greenwich, Connecticut. When you do research, to all of the folks here, you have to make sure that you start with what you know. So when doing research in the United States, the easiest way to get started is to locate your family in the 1940 United States federal census schedule. So you think, what relative do I have who was living in America, if you're doing United States genealogy, who was living in 1940? What relative do I have who was living in 1940? Think about places where they might've lived. Did they live in New York? Did they live in Connecticut? Were they in Mississippi? Maybe they were somewhere in New Jersey. Start with what you know. And remember, records are everywhere. You have census records, which are taken every 10 years and made public every 72 years. You have vital statistics and you have newspapers. So with that being said, let's dig deeper. Who am I? Let's find out. Here is a newspaper from 1934. And with this newspaper, it says, Miss Adele Merritt and Thomas Watkins, both formerly of Greenwich. So Adele, that's my great grandmother. Connecticut were married Monday of, the, of last week at the home of the bride's grandmother, Mrs. Mary Coles, 55 Clinton Avenue. The Reverend J.R. White performed the ceremony. There were about 35 guests present, including friends from Greenwich. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. This document from the 1930s tells me not only that my great grandmother and my great grandfather got married, but it tells me that they used to live in Greenwich and that they got married at 55 Clinton Avenue, which is in New Rochelle. They were married at my great grandmother's grandmother's house. So now I just met another ancestor, my great, great, great grandmother, Mary Coles, and the person who performed the ceremony was Reverend J.R. White. And 35 people were there. And they came from as far as Rhode Island. I didn't know that my family knew folks in Rhode Island. That was intriguing to me. My family, my African-American family in the 1930s had a wedding ceremony in New Rochelle where they had almost 40 guests that came from as far as Rhode Island crazy. I was able to find in Greenwich, Connecticut, Grandma Adele's birth certificate. It turns out that her name wasn't Adele when she was born. It was actually Mary. Her name was Mary Adele Merritt. She was born in Greenwich and lived at 36 Cassidy Park. She was born on the 27th day of September, 1913. Her father's name was John Sherman Merritt and he was 23 years old and listed as colored, and he worked as a day laborer. And her mother's name was Lilia Robinson, or Robertson, who was 20 and listed as colored. Number of child of mother was fourth and number living was three, which lets me know that there was another sibling somewhere who had passed away. Grandma Adele, 1913. I was able to find a document for John Sherman Merritt, my great great grandfather. And this is a document from World War I. This is his draft registration card. And notice 37 Cassidy Park in Greenwich. It says he was born December 10th, 1890. It says he was born in Greenwich. He worked as a laborer. He was self employed and he had a wife and three children. Married, race African. And at the bottom is his beautiful signature my great-great-grandfather, John Sherman Merritt. That is a picture of me, 
around 2019 when I had a little bit more weight on me. And that is a picture of my great, great grandfather, John Sherman Merritt. I was able to find the marriage document for my great, great grandparents. This was in Rye. John Sherman Merritt, who was born in Greenwich, was the son of Edward Merritt, who was born in Portchester. My family, my African-American New York family was in Westchester going back this far. If John Sherman Merritt was born in 1889, slash 1890, and his dad was born in Portchester, we have to be back to at least 1870 something now. His mother was Mary Roselle. She was born in Staunton, Virginia. Lilia Robinson, my great great grandmother, worked as a waitress. She was born in Staunton, Virginia. Her father, James Robinson, was born in Spotwood, Virginia. And her mother, Mary Robinson, was born in Staunton, Virginia. We remember Mary Robinson because that's where the wedding took place for John and Lilia's daughter, Adele. Here is a photograph from the wedding day of my great, great grandparents. I had the photograph colorized. This picture was taken January of 1909 in Rye, New York. This is a picture of Little Bethel AME Church in Greenwich. In this picture, in the front row, if you look all the way to the right, in the front row, you'll see a man. Next to him, you'll see a child. And next to that child, you'll see another child. That's my Uncle Joe. So all the way in the front row, that third child from the right is my Uncle Joe. In Sunday school, at Little Bethel AME Church in 1920. I actually found this picture in a book. And I know Uncle Joe because Uncle Joe's eyes. Not to mention I've had relatives tell me that that was him, but we know Uncle Joe from those eyes. John Sherman Merritt and Lilia Bell Robinson had four children. You met Grandma Adele, and now this is Grandma Adele's sister, Aunt May. Aunt May was born in Greenwich and became a beautiful Harlemite. She was a New York City woman. She was born in Connecticut and moved down to the city during a time when it was beautiful. In the 1930s, the 1940s, she went to Pratt Institute. She was born in 1917, graduated from New Rochelle High School, and then attended Pratt Institute for Fashion. She became one of the leading Black women in Harlem, marrying one of the most powerful businessmen in Harlem at the time, Aunt May. Those are all of John Sherman Merritt and Lilia Bell Robinson's children who lived to adulthood. Adele Matilda Merritt, James Glover Merritt, Joseph Francis Merritt, and Lilia May Merritt, my great-grandmother and her siblings. Let's dig a little bit deeper, shall we? This is Uncle Joe. That is my Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe's father, who you have already met, my great great grandfather, is John Sherman Merritt. Now, what I love about these pictures is that not only are they my ancestors, but the picture all the way on the right, if we just do a little analysis for a moment. Look at that picture. That picture was taken in 1920, over a hundred years ago. And here you see a man who's proud, a man who's dressed and his right hand is holding a cigar, has his hat on, the house that he and his family own in the background, all the way in the back, you can see the neighbor's clothing line. 
You can see the steps leading to the back of the house. And this is in Connecticut, a snapshot in time, 1920. If only I can go back in time and ask him some questions. I was able to find his birth certificate. John Sherman Merritt was born on Tuesday, December 10th, 1889. His father was named Edward Merritt and was born in Port Chester, and he was a driver. His mother was named Mary Whalen, and she was born in Spring Hill, Virginia. That is a photograph of John Sherman Merritt when he was a child, circa 1895. Look at the background. Look at the men in the background in the 1890s. What could they have been talking about? What could have been stressing them out in 1895? What were they doing? Where were they going? What was on their mind? And here's a young boy on his front porch getting his picture taken. Probably proud that he's taller than he was the last time he had his picture taken. My great, great grandfather. This beautiful picture that time has almost never even touched is of John Sherman Merritt's mother, Mary Elizabeth Roselle. Meet my great, great, great grandmother, Mary Elizabeth Roselle. I brushed up the picture on the left. The original picture is on the right. Look at the pocket watch around her. The small waist, <laughs> the long hair. That picture was taken in 1900. It is 122 years old. That picture is 122 years old. And I'm fortunate enough that my family still has these photographs today. This is William Henry Roselle, Mary's brother, my great, great, great grandmother's brother. A fun story about Uncle William. It was Uncle William from Virginia. And once upon a time, Uncle William was traveling and he was on a trolley car. And Uncle William got up from his trolley car and he went home and he realized that he had left something. Uncle William had lost his gun. He actually carried his gun and he lost it. Seven months later, someone had came to him and said, William, we think this belongs to you. No questions, no nothing. He got it back seven months later. Somebody brought it to him. How? You never know. In 1896, there was a city directory for someone named Edward Merritt who was living in Port Chester. Because remember, John Sherman Merritt's father was from Port Chester. So when we try and look for him, here's an Edward Merritt in 1896, and he's colored. So he looks like a match for one of my ancestors. He's living at 33 Oak Street, Edward Merritt. There's another Merritt who's colored in Port Chester named Hulda Merritt, and she's living at 33 Oak Street. Edward and Hulda. So the question becomes, are they related because they're living in the same place and have the same last name, Edward and Hulda. 
and I found this. Edward B. Merritt, aged 30 years, died at the residence of his parents here on Sunday in the 31st year of his age. The cause of death was Sedema of the Gladys. He was the son of Abraham and Halda Merritt and was formerly employed in the office of real estate agent D.M. Ambler. The funeral services were held on the 8th and interment was in the Colored Cemetery adjoining Union Cemetery in Rye. Hold on, hold on, hold on. My third time's great grandfather, my great, great, great grandpa was born in 1870 and died in 1901. 1870 and died in 1901. That means John Sherman Merritt lost his father at 11. So shortly after the picture was taken of him on that porch, a few years after his father died. That also means that I know where my great, great, great grandfather is buried. He's buried right in Rye. That also means I know that he worked in a real estate office in 1901. The story goes that Black men worked in cotton fields as laborers, as those who are subservient to others. But my great, great, great grandfather doesn't fit that stereotype because he was employed in a real estate agent's office. He knew how to read and he knew how to write. His son was having photographs taken on his front porch. That beautiful picture of John Sherman Merritt's mother was taken in 1900, a year before Edward died. The family was doing pretty well. My family in Westchester. Things that make you go, hmm. That is Edward Merritt. John Sherman Merritt's father. That is Edward Merritt, John Sherman Merritt's father. Holder Merritt is buried in Rye. And I actually visited her headstone, went, visited her and saw her headstone. She was born July 9th, 1836 and died March 14th, 1914. Her headstone still stands today. That's my four times great grandmother, a black woman who was buried in Westchester County, whose headstone I can visit, whose gravesite I could visit any day because it still stands. And she died in 1914, well over a hundred years ago. I was able to find in the 1880 census, Abraham Merritt, Abraham was listed at, as 59 years old, living with his wife, Hulda, and children, Emma, Norton, and listed, it should say Edward, but they wrote Edwin. And if you look, Norton was listed as black male, 12, the son of the household, and he goes to school. Hulda, black female, 45, was keeping house, and Abraham, black male, 59, was a farmhand. My family, my family, 1880. But how far back could we really go? Let's find out. In the 1870 United States federal census, there goes Abraham listed as Abram Mary, living with Hulda. Children, Ezra, Augusta, Emma, and now Lorton, but Norton. And they were all born in Connecticut. So my family was yet to make the move to Westchester County. In 1870, they were living in Greenwich, Connecticut, all listed as Black. But what's interesting is if you look, the census taker had to go over the color column again, because for some reason, they were all originally listed as white. Hmm. Things that make you go, hmm. All of those are W's. They had to go back and write B for black. Prior to 1870, 
When you talk about the 1860s, in America, you talk about slavery. Slavery in the past year, the past two years, has become such a divisive conversation, such a powerful conversation. It's been a conversation that many have tried to avoid. And the question is, if my family was so successful, so successful in the 1950s and 60s, so successful in the 30s and 40s, so successful in the 1920s and 10s, and we're working in real estate at the turn of the century. Were my family slaves? Was my family enslaved? Was my family enslaved? If I can find my family in the 1860 United States federal census, before the end of the Civil War, that means they were free. But if they do not appear in the 1860 United States Census, that means that they were slaves. The first census document in this country that Black Americans are found, majority of them, over 4 million, is in 1870 because in 1865, the enslaved were freed. So in 1860, if you see Black Americans listed, they were free. Is my family listed in 1860 or not? I researched to find out. Do I find Abraham and Holda in 1860? Here is the 1860 United States federal census. And if you look, you see Abraham Merritt, is a 41-year-old Black man who is a day laborer, who has $50 worth of personal estate. Holda is a 26-year-old Black woman and they're living with their children. Laura, Ezra, Mary, and Irene. My family was not enslaved. My family was free in 1860. When the Civil War was raging, when folks were being killed left and right, fighting over the cause, when they were saying the South shall rise again, my family was free in 1860. I was actually able to find a man named Charles Merritt in 1840, in the census of 1840. So I found Abraham in 1860, then 1850, then 1840. So in 1840, I find a Charles Merritt. And it said that Charles Merritt lived with three males who were colored between the ages of 10 and 23. And I wondered if one of those colored males, what we would call today, one of those black boys, I wonder if one of them was Abraham. Is Charles the father of Abraham? Did I meet another ancestor? Was my family free in 1840, 25 years before majority of Black Americans got free? How, how would I know if Charles is the father of Abraham? I would have to do some more research. Let's go back even further. In 1831, there was a woman named Catherine Merritt who was baptized January 23rd. Catherine had three sons. Wait a minute. Abraham, who I think might be the son of Samuel, Samuel, Abraham, who I think might be the son of Charles, Charles had three sons. And if you look, it says Abraham, Merritt, Samuel, H, and Jarvis, M, children of Catherine. So there go three black boys, Abraham, Samuel, and Jarvis, children of Catherine Merritt, were baptized March 3rd, 1831. There's Abraham. I know when my great, 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 grandfather was baptized. He was baptized March 3rd, 1831. I know when my great, great, great grandfather was baptized. He was baptized March 3rd, 1831. Here is the death certificate for Samuel Henry Merritt. And if you look at line 13, his father's name was Charles Merritt and his mother's name was Catherine Purdy. Meet my four times great grandparents, Charles Merritt and Catherine Purdy. 
Date of death was June 1st, 1903. Date of birth was April 7th, 1823. He died at 80 years old, one month and 24 days. This is Abraham's brother. This is my great, great, great grandfather's brother. Line 10 says he was a male, he was black, and he was not Negro. Negro was crossed out and they said he was mixed, which would explain why his brother in the 1870 census, 1860 census was listed as white originally and then black. The family was mixed. Samuel Henry Merritt, death certificate has Negro crossed out and it says he's mixed. His father's Charles Merritt, his mother's Catherine Purdy. Samuel's buried in Union Cemetery. How far back does this go? Let's keep going back. I found a document from 1858 that says I, Jarvis M. Merritt of Greenwich in the County of Fairfield, Connecticut for the consideration of $250 received to my full satisfaction of Samuel H. Merritt. Wait, 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 wait. Samuel Henry Merritt, Jarvis Merritt. Let's go forward a little bit. Abraham, Samuel, and Jarvis. These are my great, great, great uncles. They're playing patty cake. They're having fun. They're buying and selling land from one another and selling it back to each other. Jarvis, for $250, received from Samuel, what? From Samuel H. Merritt, one certain tract of land lying in said Greenwich with the buildings thereon, two roads boarded north, west, da, 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 by land of Charles Merritt. To the market. They were buying and selling land up to $250 in 1858. When I was in school in Yonkers, I thought that prior to 1865, Black people were slaves. They were supposed to be picking cotton in the field somewhere. They weren't supposed to know how to read and write. They were waiting for Harriet Tubman to free them on the Underground Railroad. My ancestors were in Connecticut and New York buying land for $250 in Greenwich and selling it to each other. Here's a document from March 23rd, 1823. We are in the year 2022. This document is almost 200 years old. This document is almost 200 years old. This document is almost 200 years old. Know ye that I, L. Nathan Husted of Greenwich, Fairfield County and State of Connecticut for the consideration of $75 received to my full satisfaction of Charles Merritt, a man of color. Do give, grant, bargain, sell, and confirm unto the said Charles Merritt on certain piece of land and being in said Greenwich containing two roads bounded north and west and south by my own land, east by land of Peter, Avery, and West. My ancestor. So Grandma Adele is my great-grandmother. John Sherman Merritt is my great-great-grandfather. Edward Merritt is my great, great, great grandfather. Abraham is my fourth great, my five times great grandfather. Charles Merritt is buying land in 1823. The time I thought that my ancestors were supposed to be enslaved somewhere in Mississippi or South Carolina, they're in Connecticut 200 years ago. 199 years ago, respectfully, buying land. How far back does it go that my family was free in this country? How far back does it go? What did it mean for them to wake up knowing that millions of people who looked like them were enslaved? 
that even though they were buying and selling land and they were going to school and they had money, people who looked like them a few states over were being treated like property. What did that look like? What did that feel like? What did that mean? I found a document that states the birth. You are looking at the birth certificate of my five times great grandfather. You are looking at the birth certificate of my five times great grandfather. And just to let you know how the ancestors talk, Charles, son of Peg, born May 11, 1791, and Jack, son of Peg, born February 14, 1793. My fifth great uncle has a birthday coming up this month. My fifth great uncle has a birthday coming up this month. He was born almost 220 some odd years ago. Almost 230 years ago, really. Nathan Merritt had Negro children. Nathan Merritt had Negro children's births. Who is Nathan Merritt? Who's Peg? Because it looks like through this document from 1791 and 1793, I just met my six times great grandparents, Nathan Merritt and Peg. I have a document from July of 1790. And it says, know all men by these presents that I, Daniel Lyon Jr. of Greenwich, County of Fairfield and State of Connecticut, for and in consideration of the sum of 50 pounds New York money, to me in hand. And then when we skip down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines, my Negro girl named Peg about 20 years of age. I found where the slavery comes in in my family. My family were not slaves in the 1820s and 1830s and 1840s, 50s and 60s. My family was slaves in this country in the 1700s on my father's side. My Negro girl named Peg. So Daniel Lyon sells Peg to Nathan Merritt, July of 1790. When I was in school, I learned that roughly it takes about nine months to have a child. July of 1790, and then May of 1791. July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, and then May a baby's born. Peg is sold from Daniel to Nathan. And in 10 months, a baby's born. I wonder if it was consensual. Because my ancestor Peg was a slave. Slavery. It affected my family too. Slavery, it affected my family too. I found a document from Nathan. Remember Uncle Jack who was born on Valentine's Day in 1793? Well, when Uncle Jack was three, Nathan wrote this document and he said, no all, Men, by these presents that I, Nathan Merritt Jr. of Greenwich in the county of Fairfield, for and in consideration of the sum of 15 pounds New York money to me in hand, paid by Simon Lyon of said Greenwich. Da, 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 da. A Negro boy named Jack, age three years, all the way towards the bottom. A Negro boy named Jack, age three years. So remember Peg had two sons? Nathan sold Jack at three. Peg was sold at 20, had two sons, 
and then her three-year-old was sold from her. Slavery. It affected my family too. He signed that document in 1796, August 18. The upside is that in 1837, there was a document that I found that said Plato Green, Alan Green, Charles Merritt, Jack Merritt, Solomon Green, and Anthony Green had a land transaction. And the document said that they were all brothers. My sixth great grandmother, Peg, ended up having six sons. And despite the cruelties of slavery, all of her sons not only were able to gain their freedom, but they all were able to find each other, stay with each other, and work with each other. They took on different last names, Green, Merritt, Jack later changed his last name to Houston and became Jack Houston. But they found each other and stayed with each other. Benjamin Woolsey Lyon, Negro children, Plato, born November 1798, and Anthony, born 1795. Wait a minute. Those names look familiar. Plato Green and Anthony Green. Because it said Nathan had Negro children and then it says Benjamin Woolsey Lyon had Negro children. So Plato and Anthony. Hmm. Daniel Lyon, the man who sold Peg originally, left a will. And in his will, he talks about his property and what have you. And as I did research and DNA research, it turns out that Daniel Lyon was Peg's father. Benjamin Woolsey Lyon was Peg's uncle. DNA shows that I'm related, I'm descended from a white merit male who I would assume is Nathan Merritt because when Peg was sold to Nathan Merritt, 10 months later, she has a baby named Charles, who I'm descended from. So DNA shows, and there are dozens of DNA cousins that I have who are all connected to these families, that apparently Daniel Lyon was the father of Peg. So Peg was half white because she had a white father and a black mother, half black. Daniel sold his mixed race daughter to a man who apparently then impregnated her and she had a mixed race child. So this child had a black mother, a biracial mother and a white father. She was eventually sold back to the Lyon family to her uncle, Daniel's brother, Benjamin Woolsey Lyon, who then took it upon himself to free her. So her white uncle gave her her emancipation papers. Slavery, it affected my family too. So with that, knowing the DNA shows that I do come from Daniel Lyon, Peg, essentially, whose last name you could say would have been Lyon, though she was born enslaved, 
was the daughter of Daniel Lyon, the granddaughter of James Lyon, the great granddaughter of John Lyon, going all the way back to William Keith, the second Earl, born in 1452. My family. William Keith's family tree goes all the way back to the Douglas family, the Erskine family, the Lindsays, the Stewarts, the Hamiltons, going all the way back to the 1300s in Scotland. I did an ancestry DNA test. And wouldn't you know, it showed that not only the majority of my ancestors come from West Africa, but that I actually do have Irish and Scot Scottish DNA. Slavery, it affected my family too. My uncle, my grandmother's last living sibling is in his eighties and he has a first cousin who's in his eighties. And I had them both do DNA tests. And it turns out that the majority of their DNA comes from Cameroon as does mine. It looks like Peg's family, her black family came from Cameroon. Doing a little bit of admixture research, a little bit more DNA, breaking it down, breaking it down, breaking it down, trying to break it down to see what's what. It looks like my ancestors would either come from the Feng, Bamon, or Kaba peoples in Africa, Feng, Bamon, or Kaba peoples in Africa. And it turns out that the Feng people were victims of the large transatlantic slave trade between the 16th and 19th century. It says their villages were raided, thousands of their wooden idols and villages were burnt. And the Feng people later discovered that they were not cannibalistic. What happened was when folks would see the Fang people, my ancestors, and they would see skulls and all these other things, they would think, oh, these folks are cannibals. But it was just the way that they did their religious practices. The Bamon people, also Bamon or Mum people, are found in Cameroon. So when we speed up a little bit, remember the ancestry DNA test said Cameroon. The admixture DNA said it looks like my ancestors based on my DNA had Bamon. And lo and behold, Bamon, a Bantu ethnic group comes from Cameroon, an ancient walled city, pre-colonial central state, and it was a kingdom. Thank you for allowing me to do this presentation. And I would like to open the floor for any questions, any comments, and anything that you all would like to talk about. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Dennis. That was fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, so people, you can just unmute yourself if you have any questions. Um, Dennis, that was fantastic. and very intriguing and very inspiring. It makes me want to do more in terms of looking deeper into my roots. Um, I'm Puerto Rican, so I come from an island. So I'm sure it would be a little bit more difficult. Um, I have tried to research, for example, my grandmother in the Yonkers Public Library Archives, ended up finding members of my both sides of my family. However, I didn't go as extensive as you did. So I guess my question is, um, with families that aren't as prominent as yours, because you come from a background of people who were able to take photos, who were able to collect and archive their existence. Um, is there any kind of advice that you would give those who may not have had that opportunity? Are there other routes that we can take to finding information other than photos? Most definitely. And thank you for that amazing question. 
When it comes to research, particularly research with those who are from places like Puerto Rico, there are a plethora of documents. And places like Puerto Rico are known for the amazing records that they kept in churches. So for your research, you would be doing a lot of digging in church records, looking through baptismal records and marriage certificates. Just because families weren't as prominent as others doesn't mean that documents did not exist because folks got married, folks were born, folks were baptized last Christian, Christian, excuse me, and folks passed away. So records do exist and they exist everywhere. The challenge and the fun and exciting part is just finding them. So once you start with one record, it opens the door to the rest. It's just a matter of knowing where to look to find them. So they do exist. And because you said Puerto Rico, you can probably research your ancestors farther back than I could mine, because the research that can be done in Puerto Rico can get extremely extensive. Wow. Yeah, I never thought about churches um, that actually make a very good point. Thank you, Dennis. Of course. Hi, my name is Diane. And first, I'd like to thank you for that beautiful presentation of your family. It was very interesting. I loved it. Um, my question is, you have these research programs out here now, the Ancestry.com and Archive, whatever. Um, where did you start your research? Did you start with the Ancestry.com? And also, you said you did the DNA. Mm -hmm. So I was interested about the DNA. Um, what, you know, what company did you use to do that? Sure, sure. Thank you for that awesome question. You have a lot of folks out there who argue which DNA company is better. Oh, go with Ancestry. Oh, go with 23andMe. Oh, go with this one. The first thing you do is you start with what you know. So I had taken my great grandmother's name and put it in Ancestry.com and saw what came up. And I found something and I was just in awe. This was 2008. I was 13 years old at the time when I first did that. So that's how I got started. But you always start with what you know. So with that, you can start with the 1940 census or you can start doing your digging if you can with the folks in your family and around you. So that might look like for those of us who were not adopted, that might look like calling uncle such and such, a cousin such and such. Do you have this one's birth death certificate? Do you have this one's obituary? Do you know when this one did whatever, whatever? Do you remember grandma's um, old book? Do you have her, her book when she you know, wrote whatever? So that might look like that. For a lot of folks who are adopted, DNA comes in because it gives you the opportunity to connect to cousins that you didn't even know you were connected to. So you might have a first cousin and now you could say, okay, well, how many aunts and uncles do you have? Because I'm trying to find, so that's when DNA and what have you come in. People look at DNA for all different reasons. Some folks like me do it to try and see where we come from. Other folks do it to try to locate relatives. They look for a son or a daughter. They look for their child. They look for a sibling. They look for a parent. So always start with what you know. And it's easy to get started because people don't realize how much they already know. And then the rest is just easy after that. Dennis, can you remind me what databases you use for your research? Sure. I definitely used Ancestry.com. I used FamilySearch.org. I used Fold3.com. But nothing beats getting up and going to a library or an archive or a city hall and doing some real authentic research, mm -hmm. real authentic research. Hello, um, 
my name is Louise and I'm calling from Reno, Nevada. Nice, thank you for joining us, awesome. Well, my question is, I was really impressed with the slides that showed documents, um, uh, especially regarding uh, pay, um, but you didn't describe what, uh, you know, exquisite handwriting describing property. So um, were you looking, um, what documents did you find that in? That's my question. Sure, sure. Greenwich, Connecticut, Connecticut as a whole is a state that held on to their record. So often when doing research in the South, South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, Virginia, Texas, it's a hit or miss for a lot of counties because of the Civil War. So a lot got burned, a lot got destroyed. So there are gaps, you know, oh, we have wills from 1780 to 1860, and then we have wills from 1870 on. They're like, well, what happened to those other five? Oh, you know, the war and this and that. Greenwich has records going back to the 1660s that are still intact that do not read plain English. And yea, all thou cometh to thy, giveth to thy daughter, and we cometh with thy. You're like, what is this? All thou cometh with the Indians and the old Negro with thy this. And he said, well, I can't read this. And it's written funny. And it's, I mean, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of years old. So as you look through these old records, so it was, to answer your question, it was an old land record books, you know, an old land record book from the 1850s. And then, you know, you have this other book and it's like, in this book, you'll find last names, this, 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 this. And then you look through all these old pages and you flip through these pages. And I mean, huge books that you, that are 50, 60 pounds, you know, because back then there were no computers. So it was just huge books that folks wrote in longhand. And they would explain people in the books, you know, Charles Merritt, a man of color, you know, and depending on the record, they would even get really detailed, you know, um, you know, uh, Abraham Merritt and his brother, you know, and all of the, so these old books in this library is where I would find that in, in the archives in Greenwich. And folks have archives. Sometimes the people working in places don't know what's there. I was researching and I was looking up a man named Ichabod Purdy, a black man named Ichabod Purdy, born 1797. And he lived in Armonk. So I went to Armonk, to City Hall in Armonk, New York. And that's Upper Westchester for those who don't know. And I was there and I said, I'm looking for some, I was in high school. I said, I'm looking for some records on slaves in City Hall. And they're like, what? And I'm like, I'm trying to find some records and I know that they're here. And they're like, we don't have records on slaves here. I said, of course you do. And he said, no, we don't. And it became this heated thing. I said, if you go down to your basement, to your archives, you will find some old books. And I guarantee you, they have slaves mentioned in those books. And these women looked at me and they said, come back in 30 minutes. I left, I went outside, I sat on a park bench. I went back in there in 30 minutes and they found an old book from the 1800s. And I said, this is what I was looking for. And I flipped through that book because I had found an excerpt online that said something, something, Ichabod, a Negro, and Armand. And I'm like, oh, this, is, this exists. So they found an old book. And in it, it said, I, Nathan Purdy, free my Negro man, 26 years old, Ichabod, blah, 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 in Arma, and it said in North Castle, New York. And I said, this man is my ancestor. And I just wanted to let you know that I knew he was freed here and I needed this original document. And they almost broke down and cried because they said, you know, we've been working here for X amount of years and we never knew that this existed below us. And I said, yeah, here's a book full of black folks who were enslaved here in Armonk, North Castle. And it's in your archive. So, you know, it, it, and, it's, and it's not, you know, trying to make anyone feel guilty or feel bad. It's history. And often we've been taught either A, this history doesn't exist, or B, not to acknowledge it. But when you actually see it in real time, like here's a book, a ledger of people being sold 
John was $400, Sarah was 600 and Mary was three. And they were all siblings and they were separated and one was sold to, you know, like if you, you know, just to say one was sold to Nourishell, one was sold to Yonkers and one was sold to White Plains. And you're like, I didn't know they had slavery here. Oh my gosh, it becomes real. And that's not to try and make anyone feel bad, but the truth defends itself. And you just find it, you know? Louise, I gave you a very long answer for a very quick question. Excuse me. Thank, thank you so much. Um, this has been very, very interesting. Sure. This is Judith Waite. Do you think you might continue looking for where Margaret came from, Peg? I love that question, Judith. And the answer is yes, 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 because I Wonderful. know, I'm sorry. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> the records are out there. I just have to find them. I don't know where they are. I don't know where they are. I don't know what archive. I don't know what library, but I'm sure that I'll find them one day. And the good thing is that I got in it young. I started in 2008 at 13. Yeah, that, that was so amazing that you um, began this whole process when you were so young and just followed through in such an amazing way. Congratulations. <laughs> and thank you for sharing it. <clears throat> Thank you, Judith. Thank you. You know, it's funny. I, I know we're over an hour. I don't want to hold anyone up, but it's funny because, you know, other teenagers wanted clothes and to buy a car. And I would take money that I received from birthdays and Christmases and buy death records and marriage certificates. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> well, good on you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It's like, I need some sneakers. What do you want? It's like, I need some death records. It's like, what? It's like... <laughs> well, good. Keep on keeping on. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm glad, look, I mean, look, this is, so 2008, 18, 19, 21, 22, this is 14 years worth of research. And I'm glad that I could put it together and, and folks look at it and, you know, find it worth wanting to stay on a Zoom meeting for. I didn't think this 14 years ago that someone would be interested in wanting to know this stuff. I just thought it was fun for me. So to know that people are actually interested and intrigued, thank you. And to all of you in the chat, Donna, who has said beautiful and thank you, thank you, Donna and Judith, thank you. And, you know, Rose and Louise, thank you. I'm, I'm really humbled. And, and I would be remiss if I said that I wasn't, because I am. And to be around such wonderful folks who are allowing me the privilege to share my family history with them, thank you. And I thank you, and on behalf of my ancestors, they thank you as well, because their story is not in vain. So thank you. Will you visit Cameroon and Benin? I would love to. So yes, the answer is yes. Good. I don't know when, but oh yeah. And yeah. I could only imagine what that experience is going to be like. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dennis. Thank you. Yeah, that was absolutely brilliant, Dennis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. And thank you for reaching out and I'm glad that we were able to put this together. Yeah, same with me. Yeah, you've certainly inspired me to work on my own genealogy research. I love it. <laughs> yeah. All right, does anyone have any other questions or else we'll just close for tonight? Great, thank you all for joining and please don't forget that we have a whole month full of Black History Month events, as well as our regular YPL programs. You can find them easily at ypl.org. And um, there's a lot in store this month. So make sure you check out all of the rest of the programs that the librarians are putting together. And Dennis, we look forward to your updated research. Everyone Thank have a good so night. Much. Thank you. you. Have a good night. All right, have a great night. Thanks everyone. <laughs>